Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our first um, session for administrators uh, that we're hosting here at Region 10. And uh, most of you are either in a video conference uh, room or you are using your laptop to get the information uh, that we are providing you for this particular coming school year. So again, welcome to this afternoon. Um, it's going to be a very um, informative particular session and we'll hopefully we'll be able to get some interaction from the individuals out in the field. Um, I'm going to take attendance. So my name is Miriam Kelly and I work with the Migrant Education Program. Um, those of you that are veterans and most of you are because you uh, signed up for the afternoon session um, know who I am and um, look forward to working with you this afternoon. I have here that um, Claudia Alcendra signed up for this particular session. Claudia, are you here? Um, Lisa Bridges, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And am I pronouncing your first name right? I am that. Thank you. Joanna? Uh, here. Scare never. Trisha Meek, are you here? Martha Rojas. Christy Matlock. And Lucy Medrano. Well, Lisa, it looks like it's you and me, <laughs> which is fine. Um, anyway, I'll take attendance again and see who we pick up along the along the way. Miriam, Lisa, as we yes, there are six or seven others showing up on the Zoom screen. I just don't know. Maybe they don't know how to. Uh, click in or out to let you know that, but they show okay. across the top of my screen. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, those of us that are either on the Zoom camera or we are on the video conference, if we can make sure that we send Esther the attendance sheet, then that would be very valuable for us to uh, document the fact that individuals are out in the field and were indeed uh, part of this particular afternoon session. Will that work for everybody, I hopefully? And we're hopefully figuring out how, which buttons to push. This is all new to a lot of us, so we will be able to work through this together and um, a couple of years from now, we'll just kind of laugh at what happened today. So uh, we'll be okay. Uh, but I do want to give people credit for having been here and also to be part of the, the short interaction that we've got planned um, this, this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, we sent out to you, and please forgive us, it was late in the afternoon, um, information that should be helpful to today's session. You should have a handout that um, deals with um, a survey, and it's really more of a before and after kind of situation, what you know now and what you'll know after we um, interact with each other. We have a sheet that's called Who is Responsible? We have a Freyer model. We have a table of content for the IDNR manual. And we have the administrative manual itself. We have a table of contents for the new generation system. And we have a manual for the new gen uh, for the new generation um, information that we need to provide you for this particular school year. Okay, so those are the pieces that Esther sent out to you, and you should have available uh, on your laptop. We'll be using some of these particular pieces in order to be able to um, get our work done this afternoon. Also, you were given some information. If I'm Correct, because that's why some of us are using the Zoom way of communicating. You got an email uh, from Vicki Sullivan who provided you with information as to how to get onto Zoom. And then we took advantage of that particular um, 
information piece to provide you. Deanna Sanchez also sent you information yesterday regarding um, our em uh, ele electronic notebook that we wanted to begin using this particular session. So before we get into any of the particulars, I'm going to turn over um, the mic and the camera over to Diana Sanchez, and all of you met her last year when we were introducing our new folks, but Diana is a total veteran now. She's been here for longer than almost a year, and she has gotten her feet wet constantly. It's been a joy to watch. So we're going to turn this over to her, and we're going to see how all of us are doing with getting into the electronic notebook. And I promise you, I do promise you, that no one will be left behind because of the technology. Um, that's why Esther sent out the information dealing with uh, the, the manuals um, via email so that you would have them as a hands-on uh, plan B. And um, Deanna is going to show you uh, the link that she sent out for the electronic notebook. Deanna. Hello. Um, we'll start with um, go to your email address, your email, school email, and look for an email from me, Diana Sanchez. And if you see that email on it, it should take you to a OneNote notebook. If you have um, Outlook on your computer and it and is your main um, email that you use for school. So I'll give you a second to find that email from Diana Sanchez. Uh, it might have gone to your junk folder um, and it references OneNote that a notebook has been shared with you from OneNote. Has anyone out there um, worked with OneNote before? I just discovered it in June, um, used it um, with a group of high school students to help them get organized for graduation and uh, have really found it useful for um, our purposes. If you'll watch the screen, let me, I'm gonna take myself off of camera and let you see my laptop. If you have a Windows computer and you come to the bottom left corner and you click there on the start, you'll come up with a search button. You can type OneNote, and no space between the um, one and note. Mine is already here. Um, it's purple. Looks like a notebook, says OneNote 2013. If you have that on your screen, go ahead and click it now. If you do not, it's giving you problems, issues, you can't find it. If you will go to your email that you received from Esther Carrillo yesterday afternoon, um, she attached several files. There is a file called Session for Administrators Table of Contents and Session for Administrators Manual. Um, you can go ahead and open up that PDF file and follow along with Miriam as we go through um, the sections. But if you can get into the notebook, um, it is a lot easier to maneuver around uh, the notebook because of the way that it's set up. So I'm going to go ahead and click OneNote. Uh, more than likely, your screen is going to have notebook information. Uh, if you've never used it before, the only thing you're gonna see is session for administrators. And that's what you need to click on, view notebook. Yesterday, I invited everyone who signed up for the training 
the email that was sent out to you uh, by Esther, I used that email address to send you the link to the notebook. So if you click the link from your email from Diana Sanchez and you've got OneNote 2013 on your computer, go ahead and click View Notebook. And sometimes it works. Ask if those in the same video conference if they are okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa Bridges. Yeah. Who was out there? Lisa Bridges. Is the only one? Lisa, are, um, are you working with OneNote or are you going off of the PDF file that was sent? Actually, I'm going off the PDF file just because I pulled it up and was able to view it. So. Okay. Perfect. And I'm forwarding that. I'm forwarding your information to other people who are requesting that on the chat. Oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Right. Trying to get into my notebook. It's a little. It's a little slow today. Ask her if we should wait a little longer because we will again. She's sending information. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you all let us know if the majority of you have either opened up the PDF or are on OneNote, just so we can give you a little extra time if you need it to get um, to get the uh, manual up. It's being on right. No, <clears throat> the first tab is just the name of the notebook. And then you'll see that it's organized across the top with different tabs. The arrow on that fourth tab it has additional sections, as you, and you can click on them and go, go through all of them if you want to, if you've got it. If not, go ahead and go back to the title page, and you can see how I'm maneuvering through it. Um, you use the tabs. Um, under each tab, uh, there is a subsection. Here's a letter from TEA. Here's a survey that Miriam was mentioning earlier. Um, as you go through, it'll go through all of the information that we're going to share with you today. Watch for the title pages as well. That'll get you to the top of the, that particular section. We're going to use this year um, for several reasons. It's um, I just learned it in June, and it's been very easy to to use. Um, the other thing is that if we ever have any updates to this notebook um, through a process called syncing, we can go ahead and update your notebook instead of sending you a piece of paper and then you adding it to your notebook. Um, we can go ahead and just um, update the information send you an email asking you to sync, which is a um, process on, on the notebook. And all it is, all it is, is uh, updating the notebook so that you have the same version that we do. Where do they find the sync? Uh, I can show you real quick what, where the syncing button is. You'll go back to file. And then Oh, never fails. Oops, I went too far out. Let me go back. Well, worked a minute. Okay, it takes me back to the um, main page that's on the OneNote. Um, if you click the settings and this little blue uh, circle with the arrows says sync. And that will allow, whenever you open this up and you sync it, you'll be assured that you have the updated manual that, that we have. But we'll let you know if we ever update it.
can I get um, a response from you guys to let me know that you have the you're looking at the PDF um, of the session for administrators or that you've got the OneNote just uh, I got it will be great I hate to go on and you don't have what, what uh, you need to look at as Miriam goes through each section. I have the PDF. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> you want to go ahead and go forward? She has. No, there's others out there. We just can't um, hear them. It could be that they've got a mute. Possibly. Okay, oh, bear with us if <laughs> we're as we're working through Zoom here. Okay. I think that let's see. I'm going to make the assumption that we are working with the notebook, the electronic notebook. I do have a hard copy here, so if someone figures out how to communicate with me, uh, I might put it on the Elmo, or maybe I'll just put it on the Elmo just in case and just kind of work with it as we go. That might, maybe be, that, maybe that might be, be better, just, just to make sure that, 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 it, that we have it in both ways and that we are looking at the same thing. That way it's not so... Um, so I can take it. We're going to take this off of the. Um, we're going to take the electronic notebook off, just because we're. We want to make sure that everyone uh, can see the documents. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take the image off of the laptop and move it onto the Elmo. The Elmo is the middle one, right here. Okay. There we okay. go. All right. Um, in the Elmo, in the, um, on, on the hard copy, if those of you that are using the hard copy, remember that if you're using the camera, let's see, you have here, here's a letter from the Texas agency, and if you're a veteran, like most of us are in this session, you have seen this letter before. It's simply a letter that tells us that we have got to have uh, a, a migrant education program in the sense of identifying recruiting the children. So that letter just validates the program and helps us understand where the requirement is coming from. So that's what that letter really um, um, says to us. The next piece is a I call it a survey it's really a before and after kind of situation where even for us veterans you know as we're looking at this and it says who is a migrant student knows why do you know are you aware and no one's going to look at this but you so are you very comfortable and you put a three down can you articulate who is a migrant student and and what and who is an OSY out of school youth if you're kind of, oh my gosh, maybe it's kind of hazy, I'm really glad I'm hearing this again. Or if you have very little knowledge, then you, you just circle a one. Hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a little bit of more information. And you will also know where indeed to find the information. Okay, so you're either very sure, or at least you know where the information is. So you have about... Um, You have about maybe a couple of minutes to just kind of look that over, give you time to fill it out, and and work with it. So I'm going to be using you, Lisa, and please forgive me, but I'm, I'm able to communicate with you, and maybe um, you can tell me if we can move forward, because you've kind of looked at it and self-assessed yourself, and, and then we can go on to uh, the very next section. 
Yes, ma'am. I've reviewed that. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to assume that Lisa is our <laughs> person that we're going to go to in order to get uh, kind of like a barometer for next steps, okay? Okay. I want to also point out, and it would be in the, let's see. I got it. If you have a hard copy or if in if you are in the in in well let's just talk about the hard copy. If you have the hard copy of the electronic notebook what we were what we managed to do this time is to put a table of contents. Kind of novel idea. <laughs> but we had the time and so uh, I want to uh, praise Esther for being able to do this for us. So you can follow along. It won't be as, um, you know, as I move back and forth between the electronic notebook and the hard copy. Um, the electronic notebook will have the tabs that you will see, and you, once you uh, uh, click on it, you'll see all everything that's in that tab. That's what Deanna was talking about, how neat it was for her to kind of work with that. And then here you have your table of contents, so you'll be able to keep up with that as well. Okay? So let's see. I'm going to move to the goals of the program. We've done this before. Here's your, when I clicked on goals, I got, um, wait a minute. When I clicked on goals, I was able to get the cover sheet. And then on the right hand side, as I'm looking at the computer, has a title sheet. And then it has goals for the session. As I said, as a reminder before, these goals mirror and truly reflect the organization of, this, of both the electronic notebook and the regular notebook that Esther sent out as a um, attachment. Okay, So you should be able to use the goals and just kind of check off that we've gone over that and the goals also connect to the self-assessment, so we should be able to work with that and see the connection and grow, um, grow the information that we need in order to make uh, good decisions for our children. Okay? So in the table of contents, it has the migrant uh, education program for administrators. It has a copyright that we have to put down for TEA. It has what does it mean to be a migrant, which um, is on page three. So let's go there. That's your cover sheet. Then we just talked about this particular piece in the electronic notebook. Here's your goals. These, these goals up here, let's see, zoom. Let's see if I can get that to work. This is the best that I can do in terms of that. I apologize.
I didn't, you saw what I just did. I did not have one of the, I didn't see one of the tabs just right off the bat. So I went to the little triangle, I clicked on it, and here is the section that we were talking about, which is the who section. On the electronic copy of that, that cover sheet would be page 15, and then the next page would be page uh, 17, and you'll have a picture of several migrant children. And that's the picture that you will see in the hard copy. Now, it's very, um, most of you will be able to answer this question, like who is a migrant child? And right here in that particular paragraph, it tells you who is a migrant child. It's who, um, and here's the question, who is a migratory agricultural worker or a migratory fisher? or a guardian who is migratory agriculture worker or a migratory fisher. These are the key components, the bottom line that these are the key components to making sure that that individual is appropriately classified. So you have, there's a worker here in the preceding 36 months in order to accompany or join a parent, a spouse, or a guardian who is a migratory agriculture worker or a migratory fisher. So these children, let's go back to the picture, the children in this picture must have accompanied their parents. The move must have been across school district lines because if they stay, if they find it work, let's say in Richardson ISD, and they stay in Richardson, that's called commuting, which is what most of us do when we go to work. Uh, so they have to cross school district lines and in a state comprised in, this, uh, in one single school district, which we do not have in Region 10, so I don't spend a lot of time with that. And as a child of migratory fisher resides in a school district, and again, because we don't have a lot of uh, fishing industries here in our area, I don't spend a lot of time with that. Um, because there's so much else to just kind of uh, keep in mind as we move forward. So your migratory child is someone who, who works, who either does the work or accompanies the parent, uh, crosses school district lines, who has done this for the uh, preceding 36 months. Um, Lisa, again, I don't mean to pick on you, but I kind of feel like we're connected here today. <laughs> um, how long? is the eligibility for a migrant child once a child has been identified? I don't know. Okay, let's talk about three years. Oh, three years, okay. <laughs> three years. <laughs> this, right. That's why, you know, here it talks about the preceding 36 months, okay? okay. It's three years. Um, so once, once a child has been identified, you have received the COE from Region 10, and we'll get to that section in a little bit. Their eligibility is good for three years, okay? So that pretty well answers who. We have other children, and we have a few of these in Region 10. Not a lot, but a few. Self-eligible youth refers to a youth who, and here's your bullets. A qualifying worker under the age of 22, because once a migrant child turns 22, they're no longer eligible, even if they have three years of eligibility. Um, travels on his or her own with the group. And the one to circle here or to keep in mind is that this self-eligible youth is still under the control of the parent. You know, they bring money home if that's the case and they listen to mom and dad. They're still out there under that control of the parent. So that would be the distinguishing uh, point to remember because as we move forward to, uh, let's see here, um, it talks about hmm. um, it's guardian. We talk about the emancipated youth. Remember, one was self eligible. The other one was emancipated youth. This third bullet here, traveling on his or her own. All the rest of the criteria is the same, 
except that this young person is really on their own. They may be connected to the family in some way, but they make decisions about when they go and when they wake up and who and how to spend their money, etc. So that, there's a basic difference between the self-eligible youth and the emancipated youth. In the migrant world, the parent can be a birth parent, a step parent, or a guardian. And the guardian doesn't necessarily have to have legal papers. It is the person that they happen to be living with at that particular time. They could be living with that person for a week, two weeks, three months, a year. Um, the amount of time doesn't matter. If that child is out of the home of where the actual parent lives, then that automatically becomes a guardian. More information about agricultural work, Ray Fisher, information. And then we go into the last part of that, Fam, uh, family members who migrate together. And this is probably a little bit more for our recruiter, but family members who migrate could include the father, the mother, the guardian. It could be the migrant child, the spouse. It, it just, it, it's, it's really information that allows us to figure out who owns that COE. You know, where, who do we put down on that COE as the parent? the guardian, who do we put down as the children? So it kind of gives us an explanation as to how to work that particular scenario. Now, foundational, foundational, besides knowing who is a migrant child, foundational would be surveys. Because that's the way that we identify you have already sent your family surveys into Dom Smith with Annalie Guetta, who is our other, who is our OSY recruiter, to try to call all the families on a first come first serve basis to see whether or not they have made that particular, would they have made a qualifying move? So we move down to. Here's the old survey, and the old survey really is something that we're not using anymore, but if you have extra copies like I have previously said, then go ahead and use those. It's not going to hurt anything, but we have updated it to this one. And if you want to say, okay, which one is which? This one has a little bit of more information on top of here that talks about the services that we provide, generally speaking, and the other one, the old one, as you see the top here, does not have that information. So you'll be able to tell the old and the new simply by looking at that particular section. Here's the old one, and then here's the new one, okay? And it still has a very pertinent information about uh, in the past three years, has your family lived in another Texas city or school district, another state, etc. Sometimes they've just simply moved and they say yes. So the key there would be in the past three years, has anyone in your household had a job working with any of these activities? And these are the activities, generally speaking, that count for migrant work. So a lot of us can say yes to the first question because we might have moved, but not many of us can say yes to the type of work that has been identified in this particular survey. Okay, that's your family survey. Then the information at the bottom, they usually fill out, and then there's, um, and then you know, listing of all the children that are less than 22 years old. The assumption here is that they're also listing the children that went on the move. At times, we don't understand. We might be able to decipher some of the information, so Domi may call you as a program contact simply to get some clarification, which she has done um, several times this last week and just in order to be able to uh, call the parent appropriately. Then we have it in Old Spanish and Old English. I mean Old, uh, old Spanish and New Spanish, okay, however you want to do it. Now, what the biggest reminder that, that I would um, share with you is that this survey is to be given to both newly enrolled students as well as returning students. 
And it's kind of like that language survey that is used throughout the school year when you have children coming in. So is this family survey. We give this out to every newly enrolled student and all and returning students as well. Okay, so that way we have the most up-to-date data regarding migrant work or not for all our students in our particular district. You have in the electronic notebook a flow chart which really identifies the process I just talked about. You send the family survey home, if it has a yes, um, it has um, particularly a yes on the second part, then you send it to Domi as soon as possible. This here is Domi's email address, okay? Then, because you're in the shared service arrangement, we do all the work. We will uh, contact the family, we will either talk to them on the phone, um, and generally get some, get some general ideas as to what kind of work they did. If it makes sense to us, then we'll make an appointment with them. We will determine the eligibility. We will complete the COE. We will then provide uh, the COE to you, um, and you know, we go from there. Remember that COEs, the Certificate of Eligibility, are very crucial, important documents, and indeed they are to be kept under lock and key. The document, the, the one that you get is kind of like that um, orange kind of color document that is for you to keep on, in, in the file. And the pink copy goes to the PEAMS coordinator. Somehow communication between you and the PEAMS co coordinator needs to happen so that the records in the school are correct and reflect that that particular child is indeed a migrant child. The last copy is uh, really a golden rod, and we send that to the parent, which um, by state law they are to keep. They all, we also send them a copy of the supplemental form, which goes along with the COE, and at Region 10, we have always required that particular document to be filled out. So you'll get the certificate of eligibility, and you will get the supplemental form, which provides a little bit more in-depth information regarding the, the child. Any questions, Lisa, about this or anyone else? No, I'm good. I did have one question about the survey. How sure. Long, how long should we retain those copies for our records? Like, we send them out and, you know, that's in our enrollment packet and all that. That how long? And that is a good thing. Um, okay, Lisa, that's a question I got from all my rookies this morning, and it's a really good question. Um, when you send the family surveys that have a yes on it to Domi, please keep a copy for yourself. You know, we do what we do with them. We just talked about that. I would keep, and see, that this is where the rub comes in. All family surveys, according to the information we've gotten from the state, need to be retained, all. So you have, the, you have a file maybe of the surveys you sent to the region, and then you have the file that has all the surveys that you have sent out. And that's a lot, especially for larger school districts. I would recommend a file, just special ed file, I mean, um, a migrant education program file, I would keep them until the end of the school year, and then I would shred them. I'd get rid of them. There's no need to keep the family surveys year in and year out. One, you're going to run out of space, and two, there is uh, the guidance is that we don't need to keep it beyond that particular year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Make, Thank you. Makes sense, Lisa. Thanks for the question. All right. Then we have. This is in your electronic notebook. In your hard copy, everything that is mentioned in the, in the electronic uh, notebook is in your hard copy, okay? This particular sheet is on page 24 of your hard copy, for those of you that are using that. And the question there is very, you know, it's a, 
um, important one. How does a migrant student get identified? So we have talked about the family survey. We talked about uh, field recruitment. Other ways of identifying families could be a referral. Somebody knows somebody. A lot of times when Domi goes out and he'll talk to a family and say, oh, my sisters that, you know, did that work, or I know somebody who, so here are your referrals. Recruiters interview, they complete the S, um, SDF. And our recruiter here, and I mean our, yours in, in the region, is Domi Smith and Anna Lee Guerra. Your reviewers decide if the children qualify for the program. That would be me at this point. That's the second signature that you see on the COE. You have the uh, NGS data specialist. That would be Esther Carrillo. She works on the new generation system, and she also works with the national database for migrant students, and that's the M6. Now, I know that you are familiar with this. I just know that. Now I'm going to show it on the Elmo. Okay, just a second. Okay, this may be really, uh, really small, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody, just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Okay, this is not on your, on your electronic notebook. Many of you have been getting these for years, and so you're familiar with them, and I'm just wanting to make sure that, again, we can know the difference between a unique student count, a unique student count report, which simply just identifies the number of children that are in your district. That's all it is. On the top of the report, it says unique student count. So it's right there. You're getting it from Esther once a month. It tells you all the different grade levels and the number of children in those grade levels. Thank you for your patience. Um, like I said, this is um, your unique student report, and it only has the count for your district. It's all it really has. When you look at this, if you're able to see it, this school district has two three- and five-year-olds. Important information, we'll get back to that. They have one kindergartner. They have one second grader and they have one fourth grader is a fourth grader maybe a fifth grader talk about my eyes it's a fifth grader okay total five here's your total here we have blocked out the name of the child for because of confidentiality pieces but if we go all the way across you so you'd have the name of the children you'd have the names of the campuses that they happen to be on all of this uh, alphabet soup here is that's just information from NGS. Birth date, grade level, ethnicity. I mean, type of enrollment is regular. They're going to the. They live in the school. They they live in a particular school district, and they're going to that school district. Ethnicity. If it's one, you see one. It really means Hispanic. If I, I if it's I if the child is identified as Hispanic, there is no race here. Here is the gender. This is the date of enrollment. This is where we need your eyes. When we look at the date of enrollment, and if, the ch if this is wrong, then you please call Esther and let her know that, 
because these records need to reflect your school records of when the child enrolled. Withdrawal date, we don't have any withdrawals so far. Residency verification. Esther has sent out at the beginning of the school year information, and she's requesting information as to whether or not a particular child has returned to your school district. When you send that information back to us, that is, we can use that information for residency verification. We're saying that that child has returned to your school district. We cannot make the assumption that the child has returned unless we get verification from you. In that report, we're also having you to verify um, the LEP status, whether the child went to summer school or not, all kinds of information that is useful and that we put into the new generation system. The QAD. We'll talk about that again when we look at the certificate of eligibility, but the QAD is qualifying arrival date. This is when they actually arrived at the work site. Not when they began to work, but when they arrived at the work site. And that's important because as Lisa and I have talked about, that three years of eligibility. So if the QAD to this child says 6, 10, 2014, they have eligibility till 6, 10, 15, 16, 17. So June the 10th, 2017, unless this family goes out again and does qualifying work, they will no longer be migrant. And this date here is the date that Esther actually puts the information on the new generation system. Okay? That's your unique student count report. And you'll get that every month. Now, you have one, two, three, four, five students here. And because you don't have the name of the student, you don't know which of those five students are priority for service, okay? One of those kids, because the district has one, the district has one priority for service out of the five, one of those uh, children is a priority for service. And because this is so important, and you are going to see in your This is both in your hard copy as well as in your electronic notebook, Criteria for Priority for Service. If anyone is ever going to ask us a question about the migrant program, it'll be about this. Because these children are migrant, and then on top of that, they've had an interruption of, of schooling. Might have been over the weekend. They went from one school to the other, and it could have been in the same school district. It doesn't matter. They went from one school to the other, new teachers, new school, new systems, new people, new friends, etc. So that's where you get into a situation where you're going to need information about this child, and we provide that through that Priority for Service report. So if you ever think, oh my gosh, what is Priority for Service? You have the criteria and the definition in the electronic notebook, and you also have it in your you have it in your uh, hard copy as well. Let me prove that to you. See, the hard copy, Party for Service, and it gives you the handout that was given to us by the state, and it explains everything there is to know about a Party for Service child. Again, remembering that the most important thing to remember about this is that the child has had interrupted instruction either this school year or the previous school year. And 
it goes on to provide information as to how that's determined. So if here it is, interruption. Again, you can find this in your electronic notebook. So it's interruption of instruction. And there are three indicators. Failed assessment, which would mean the state assessment. Okay, so that's one criteria, and it could be a combination of any of these exams. The child could be LEP, which is limited English proficient. The child can have been retained. This is particularly true for children in K, one and two. And the reason for that is because there's, there, there aren't any state assessments there. So we have to go with the kind, you know, what, what kind of um, experience can a child have here to get them into trouble academically at, in either in that grade or in an, or the upcoming grade. A child could be over age. And then it goes on, it gives you a lot more information about uh, the criteria that were just mentioned. If a child missed a test, for example, if a child, um, and they could have missed, missed an exam and they could not even, they didn't even have to be in the state of Texas. They could have been in Oklahoma and then they show up. They may end up if they have an uh, interu interruption of instruction because they missed the state assessment here in, in Texas. The last page in, the hand, in your hard copy on page 38, it gives you, um, if you're very visual like I am, it gives you a very succinct um, multi-process of what I just finished telling you, discussing with you, okay? Let's go back to the electronic notebook because the same information is there. Here's your process one, process two, which is what we talked about in a, here in uh, interrupted instruction. Your definitions of what else. Remember, they could have had all of these failures, but if they, have, if they hadn't experienced interrupted instruction, they're not going to appear on your priority for service. Now, naturally, we're going to be concerned about these children but the top level students that if we had limited time and limited money that we have to deal with, these would be the children that we would deal with. Then definition three. Here you are, your lap, your retained old age. The same information that is found in the hot copy is found here. The flow chart that I just talked about here is found in your um, hard copy. Any questions about that? See where we are. Okay. If there aren't any questions, and just know that we have these two different reports and that you will get them once a month. And again, veterans, you know that. So, um, Moving right along, if there aren't any particular questions, then we are going to go into our next section. Which is administrators, responsibilities, and resources. This is in your hard copy. And in your hard copy, you have, uh, this is on page 39, okay? Um,
forgive me, that's a perfect example of working with our wonderful technology and moving along. So if we're having challenges in the field or here, no, like I said at the beginning, we're all going to work through this together. I promise you. Remember here, the wonderful thing about the notebook is that it has the tabs and you can see exactly which tab you want to select and live in a little bit, for a little bit. Here the tab is responsibility and resources and like I said in the hard copy, I believe it's page 39 and here it is in our electronic notebook. So it works. Okay, this should not be new to you. It truly deals with our responsibilities as administrators and it's really a very general overview of what we should be responsible for in our administrators. Here it simply talks about um, the fact that when we are working with the migrant program we have been asked to work with um, identifying and recruiting our children. Let me go back to that. Okay. And here it talks about identification of students responsible for knowing inter and interstate coordination. We all, sh we all are working with children that come to us from all over the country and so we should have a level of understanding regarding how we coordinate services. It's a, just a wonderful resources uh, out there that support our kids and we talk about that when we talk about uh, the Texas Migrant Interstate Program, the service delivery program, um, how we provide services to our children and then how we monitor and evaluate the program. And again, we talk about identifying children, completing the proper documentation. If we're working with title funds, uh, there's always a, a, a documentation piece to that. Contributing to high standards, it's not a watering down of curriculum for our migrant children. It's the goal always stays the same. It's how we address that goal that then becomes the challenge. All, most of you that are in the SSA are indeed project districts. which means that you get funds from the state in order to support your migrant students. And as you begin to get funds from the state, you pull that money into the, to support the work that we do on your behalf for the students. Let's see. Okay. This is the sheet that I was trying to refer to. Your project districts, you receive funding, we conduct IDNR, or we conduct IDNR on your behalf. And here, you are part of the uh, SSA. And if you're not an SSA member, then usually our SSA members in Region 10, this could be different in another region. They have not gotten any funds. They haven't seen a migrant child for a couple of years. The migrant child shows up, and then you say, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I help this child? Well, you help them with all the funding that you have on every, how you help all other children, but you don't have the migrant funds, but we do. We have funds that have been allocated for that situation, and we work with you to if that child needs that, um, supplementary, supplementary support. Remember, we don't supplant, we, we uh, supplement. So that's how we work with project, non-project, but because you're part of the SSA, we do most of the work on your behalf. And it is our privilege to do that. And that information you can find on page 42 if you're following on your hard copy um, handout.
I'm going to move on to page 47 of your um, hard copy and I'm see if I can find it here. Yes, this is it. Because my question to you would be, if you have a child that comes to you and you know, usually, maybe there's some patterns here. You know that this family is going to come to you in October and you know that this child wants to play football and you know that this child is also an AP student. How are you going to work with that family and that child when they come to you in that, with all that uh, different qualities and desires? How are you going to work with that family? So that's my question to you. Because it talks about here, migrant children who are not identified may experience problems such as delays in placement or incorrect school assignments, failure to uh, count partial credits or inappropriate uh, uh, course sequence. Even if an individual migrant child does not receive services, it is important to know that they're migrant. Let's see, I'm, I'm after. Um, many of these children would not attend school, they fall behind, they can't read, they have difficulty getting along with individuals, uh, they've experienced so many different things that other children have not, that they really find um, it's not a good fit and it takes them a little while to adjust. And then if they're not placed in the proper grade, in the proper grade or in the proper classes, um, sometimes they're not quite sure how to handle that and how to give you information to help them be placed in the right uh, situation. And sometimes the parents can't advocate for them. That is our role, either us here at Region 10 or you as a program um, contact to work with these children to see that, that they can have a very successful experience when they come to us. Whether it's six months, two years, or whatever, it's trying to help them graduate on time. So this section talks a little bit about why it's important to have the migrant program and how it is that administrators can work and help support those, um, those particular children. In this particular section, and that would be on page 48 of the hard copy, It really talks about the plan. It says a recruiter who has a clear objectives and a plan for reaching them is more likely to be successful. So it really talks about how to plan for these children. How, what is it that we need to do both at the ESC level and at the campus level and at central staff? So the ESC and the district uh, district have, have an IDNR plan, which by the way is in your, your electronic notebook and it is in your hard copy. Uh, and we will talk, talk a little bit about that, but it talks about how important it is to have a plan of action for the different roles that help support our children when indeed they show up at our, um, at our doors in our particular school. Here is, a, uh, you uh, need to become familiar or already just kind of touch base and refresh our memory. Um, is the state IDNR plan template, which refers back to who does what and when, so that it kind of keeps us on our toes in terms of how to work with our children. This is an example of that. We will give you the hard copy that was done here at Region 10, and that particular uh, piece of information is the one that needs to be part of your uh, district improvement plan. Second page of the template. Now you may ask, well, how do we know that what the parents are telling us is true? How do we know that the program is indeed doing what it should be doing? How do we know all those things? So how do we make those eligibility um, determinations? Here, the state is telling us that we have a good opportunity to make good decisions based by trained recruiters by having a trained SEA eligibility reviewer, which is the second person that signs a certificate of eligibility. 
that eligibility determinations are really based on very good documentation and that documentation can indeed be supported. That we verify annual residency. That's remember I just talked to you about the fact that we send out information to you and we need to get it back from you to, to really tell us. You're telling us this child is indeed in my school district and has returned to my school district. Then we can put them on the new generation system. Um, we have annual eligibility validations. It's the state checks on how we do our work uh, every single year. They select L uh, COEs uh, randomly and they go over them to make sure that the information is correct. They go interview the family and they make sure that the information uh, that we understand the information and that we have updated accordingly. Here, see, COEs are randomly checked. Here, in this section, which is page 53 in your manual, here, it really talks about the roles of each of the individuals. At, at Region 10, the recruiter would be Domi Smith, Ana Ligueta. The designated reviewer would be me, Miriam Kelly. What is it that I'm supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? Going back to the recruiter, there are a new family moves into the district. The recruiter must check to see if the family has been identified earlier. Domi may go into the new generation system or she may go into the national database to see if these if this family has indeed uh, if this family has a history of migrancy. It makes her life so much easier when there's that kind of documentation available. Then the recruiter must request a copy of the COE from the uh, district, whether it's in Texas or in Washington or Montana, where they're coming from. And then we go on and re-interview that family. And if there are any differences between the COE that we've gotten from Texas or any place else, then we have to write another COE with the new information the family provides. Domi then brings that information to me. Um, no red flags. Then I sign it. We send the copy to you. Some more information about the duties and the responsibility of the reviewer. So I attend the training. I pass the exams. I look uh, for previous COEs that are uh, available, that might be available. I know the standards by which um, a COE is, accept is, is acceptable and the child is eligible. Um, I know when a COE needs further review. I know the supplemental documentation form. I know how to fill it out and I know the information that goes into that. I know how to interpret eligibility related data. This is what we do on your behalf. This is why I think most of you join the SSA. This is Esther, and then this is what we just talked about in terms of the state. This here takes that, a lot of that information from the text and puts it into a chart form. So it really just provides the nitty gritty, bottom line, this is what everybody does, and this is how everybody's connected. What I try to do here as I'm working with the team is to make sure that everybody knows what everybody's doing at any given time. So they can see how Domi's work impacts Esther and the NGS and how their work will impact me and how that work impacts Diana or Anali so that everyone understands uh, what their roles are and how best to be um, most efficient in carrying out those roles. Sometimes, sometimes we have this. And then we shake our heads and say, okay, we can get this done. We have an issue at the local uh, level. And we come to the regional, but because we are an SSA, we really just start at this level. We may or may not call the state for support. We get an answer from the state, which we usually do, goes back to the region, 
And then if we had independent um, MEP members, then we would send it out to, to the LEAs. But that's the process by which a difficult eligibility is um, determined. You say, well, what, what is a difficult eligibility? Why, why is that become an, uh, become an issue? Well, it may be that we had a discussion this, it was yesterday, um, spent a lot of time on it. The mom could not remember who had gone or where they had gone. And she knew what they had done. She kind of had an idea of the state they were in. But a lot of times individuals just simply take them to certain places. They're not quite sure what state they happen to be in. And so I needed some very specific information because we needed to verify that with the, with the individual that might have hired them. So we had to dig in and we couldn't move forward because it was a difficult situation. And we had to make sure that the family had indeed gone out and indeed was eligible. We spent a lot of time with that. As a matter of fact, to the point that Domi made an appointment with the parent and was meeting the parent at the district level to go over the information very carefully and so that we could all be on the same page before I decide to sign it or not sign it. Um, that's the state information here. Um, if I asked any one of you out there in the field, we keep a COE for three years as an active COE. How long do we keep an inactive COE? Seven years. So there's your filing. You have an active file for three years, and then you take that COE that, is, um, that does not have any eligibility and move it over to an inactive file, and that inactive file needs to be kept under lock and key for seven years. So in total, we keep everything for 10 years. And then we have information here that talks about, and we use this. I always encourage you to read this because this letter is really, as a principal, really would allow me to um, not only use it with migrant families, but to use it with, um, with everyone. It's both in English and Spanish. And it really talks about, um, gives me the idea of who does what in my school and who do parents call when indeed they have a particular problem or a particular issue or whether they want to praise somebody. So that information can be found on page 63 and 64 of your hard copy. And it's both in English and Spanish. So, you know, with a little bit um, of creativity, you can have a letter and a PTA meeting based on just this particular letter. Then everything else is probably something that we use and that um, it's good for you to know. You know, if we, if we send letters out to growers, individuals, ranchers, farmers, and we, we've been given a letter. We've also been given a survey uh, that we can work with our indiv the individuals that are employing everybody. Here, I'm not sure that you've ever seen this. It's very small, but it's what Domi uses when she interviews the family to identify needs. And then my next question to you would be, okay, we have identified needs, and maybe we have an academic need. A mom told us she's new to our area. I have a second grader. She's very concerned about the child because the child does not understand nor can he verbalize um, appropriately uh, the alphabet. He cannot, um, it may be a speech impediment, I'm not sure, but the child has a lot of, of uh, um, issues that the mom is really concerned about. I was able to call the program contact and graciously provide them with that information and they went right to work with, you know, working with the child. Obviously the, the child has uh, problems with reading and so we were able to work together with the family and with the school district to kind of move things forward so the child will be able to be uh, a little bit more successful, if not a lot more successful, on a campus. So that's what Domi uses. And pretty much that kind of uh, gives you a summary of some of the roles and responsibilities of 
of, um, of, of administrators. Any questions? How about, I have about 2.18. How about if we take about a 10 minute break and come back around 2.28 and then we will uh, work through some of the other pieces and then we will be able to um, continue with the other tasks that we have identified for the day. Thank you. See you in 10 minutes.
Okay, hope you had a few moments to stretch your legs and possibly if you're in that chat room, ask each other questions. Um, before I leave the responsibilities and resources for administrators, as you know, here, Esther Carillo is our new generation system uh, um, administrative assistant. And we are all working, all here at Region 10, working with the Migrant Student Records Transfer System. which embraces the new generation system. This is the history of all of those particular pieces. See, the, gen the big general umbrella, then the new generation system. Where I really wanted to go is to remind us of what you hear us talking about when we talk about M6. And the whole idea behind this here it is, and this is the reason why it requires SEAs to promote interstate and intrastate coordination of services for migratory children. So the question was, how do we do that? How do we help these kids when they move in and out of our school districts in the state and in and out of our school districts throughout the country? How do we transfer records? How do we get information? So to that end, the Migrant Student Information Exchange was set up to do just that. Domi uses it a lot, especially when we get children from out of our uh, area, from out, out of our state, because it just provides you know, some basic information that we can then share with the district. And it helps us to know where they went, or I mean, what state they're coming from, and what did they do until we get that copy of that COE, especially if they're out of state and the out of state, let's say I'm just picking a state out here in the middle, maybe it's West Virginia and they're not part of new generation system because they have to have a system but they don't have to have a new generation system for their state. They all have to be part of this M6 system. So then that's when we can't get information because the state doesn't have the new generation, then we go to M6 to see if we can get information there. And it really helps us to quickly identify what they did, uh, possibly the QAD date, and whether or not um, the kinds of questions we need to ask when we go and re-interview them as we're working with the families that move into the state of Texas. So just wanted to quickly remind you of that. On page 77, you'll find that information that you find on your electric, ele um, electronic notebook. So you have, again, the same information uh, provided to you. Now. I'm going to go on. We're going to talk about challenges very briefly. Let's see if we have it here. Hmm. This one? Okay. I think all of us would be able to answer these questions. What are those challenges? Late enrollment, early withdrawal, sometimes they're moving on weekends to do work. Remember, they have to cross school district lines. Um, the parents are working. That's not just true for migrant. It's true to, for a lot of our children. It's true for my children, for example. The child is working. Dangers in the field is something that we have to really be aware of. I mean, you have children that are out there in the fields, literally in the fields, either working or staying very close to mom and dad because they have no one to take care of them around very dangerous pesticides as well as dangerous tools. And then as we have talked about before, that alienation in school, which is very um, common to our migrant children because they haven't ever been in a school for any length of time. And, and so the older they get, the more awkward and more challenging it gets for them to kind of fit into school and if that continues to happen, um, children might consider dropping out. I'm sure you can think of other challenges since you have the frontline um, job to you know, work with all children, not just our uh, migrant kids. But we have gone from who's a migrant, family surveys, um, we have 
talked a little bit about uh, the criteria for PFS. Before we get into the needs assessment, I wanna go back to the COE and to the supplemental form. Just uh, quickly remind you, I know you've looked at these before. This is what the COE looks like. Remember I suggested that the qualifying arrival date here is most important. We've talked a lot about uh, what makes them qualified here. This is the kind of work that they might have done, whether it was qualifying work or they moved to actually to do qualifying work. They moved to do any work. I don't care what it was, but they found qualifying work, so that'll qualify them, and they found that work within 30 days of arrival. And they were seeking qualified work, but in this particular time, they couldn't find it. That's allowed only twice. So the worker has a prior history. So what, where do we get that? We get that from, M, from either NGS or M6. Or <clears throat> um, there is other credible information that indeed they did seek the work, but because of flooding, we were... We were just working with a family and they give us a bunch of uh, small cities in the, in the state of Texas and indeed those cities were flooded. I remember during, I, what, during the spring and early summer there was a lot of rain and they couldn't go pick, out, pick, pick, up, pick up the watermelons that they normally did. So the family did qualify for three extra years because we were able to verify all of that information. Then this is the work that they did. This is whether it was seasonal or temporary. This is the information that um, did they go out for economic necessity? For the most part, that's true. His FERPA, which allows us to change, exchange information, allows the parent to access records. The signature of the parent. Here's Domi's signature. And this is what we're talking about, the SEA signature. That would be my signature. Without that signature, either one of those signatures, this is not a valid COE. When the family does not go out to work, H becomes very important. So when you have sent or when you are uh, currently trying to send that information to Esther, she can verify that that child has returned. This is a residency verification that that child has returned and we don't need a signature of the parent because we have school records and we can justify that uh, with the information that you sent us. This, if we write anything on this COE, then we have to send it back to the parent so they can have a current COE. And when I was talking about the supplemental documentation form, this is the other form that you will be getting in the mail when you get a COE. Okay, if a family has done any kind of uh, work or is, or is, uh, uh, experiences this kind of situation, uh, the child moves after the parent moves or the parent moves after the child moves or there is uh, temporary employment or if they work less than seven days, there are nine different required comments that we have to put comments here. A lot of times when you get the SDF, you'll also see comments about relationship. This, this child is a guardian or this child is a grandparent. That's just to give you an idea of what's going on in the family. If there's more than one of these particular comments, required comments, then I have to really uh, not only do I review it, but I also have to sign this area here for approval. Because it can get very complicated if you have more than one comment here. And this is just to remind us here, did we send a copy to the parent? So that's what your COE looks like and your supplemental documentation form. Your continuation, remember I said, um, I think it was last year we were talking about this, we can no longer just, we can interview the parent, but we also have to begin to get documentation that truly validates and make sure, um, and we can be sure that this parent has gone on the move. So 
there are four different questions that we need to get answered in order, bef um, in order for a COE to truly qualify, our family to truly qualify. The qualifying activity. When they tell you, I picked watermelons, and I picked watermelons in this particular city, this is a pretty easy one to figure out because we can go on the internet and see whether or not the watermelon season was, uh, was happening in that particular place. The time frame. They might have said I, they picked so-and-so squash in so-and-so month. I go on the internet or I know the person in that particular uh, state and I call them up and they'll say, yeah, we did pick squash during that particular time. Else can say, no, we didn't pick uh, Christmas trees in, um, in New England during that particular time. So that's not validated. That's a red flag. Uh, is there somebody that can say that the family actually showed up to verify that the family actually made? Okay, who do we call? The grower, the rancher, the farmer? Who can, you know, who can tell us that this family actually made the move? And the one that's a little bit more difficult is whether the children made the move. So think about it. How do you verify that the children made the move? Prior to, they could just tell us, well, so-and-so you know, came with me, so-and-so, so-and-so. Now we have to go figure out, did, I, did these children actually go? So the state has given us some direction with this. You know, if they did uh, summer school, if they went to Sunday, Sunday school class, um, something that, is, um, that can be verified, maybe a neighbor, give us the name of a neighbor that can say the children were there. Uh, maybe they had some church relations and we can talk to um, a pastor or a priest or somebody um, that can tell us that indeed this family attended um, um, a services during the week and or during the week. Get pretty creative to make sure that the children um, were indeed in, uh, with the family during that time. So in this section you have a reminder of the COE and the reminder of the uh, documentation, supplemental documentation. And then probably what is new to you is this, this particular section. But to let you know that every single family in Region 10 was visited last year, and this was explained to them very carefully and very thoroughly so that when and if they came back to our area, they would have the documentation and make this process a lot, um, a lot more efficient, not spend so much time trying to find the documentation. Then we were moving here to local needs assessment. Well, I think prior to that, I wanted to go into yeah. I wanted to go back really to the grant application. This is okay. It's challenges. It's under. The challenges and applications and services, okay? That's the tab that you need to be on if you're on the electric one. If you are on the, the hard copy, it's on page 85. Very quickly, I want to show you something. Here's your Title I Part C Consolidated Federal Grant Application. This shows us the different parts, and this is what we fill out on your behalf. I wanted to bring this up in particular because part three is the required program activities. When you say, well, why are we doing that, and why are we doing this, this is why. We have to select all of them if we're going to be part of this program. And that means we do IDNR. We conduct IDNR activities as outlined by the IDNR plan. We do NGS. We do migrant service coordination. This is first uh, grading period. Within the first grading period of the school year, the child who is eligible for migrant services determine individual needs, identify available resources, and then we go into the services that can be provided to the child. See, within the first grading period, migrant service coordination, coordinate with school staff in Texas Migrant Interstate Program. This is that TMIP program that 
I mentioned earlier, to ensure that migrant students who have failed any subject uh, or the state test can be given some opportunity to correct that. Then here's one particularly for secondary students. Again, what do we have to do in order to make sure that the child has credit uh, uh, accrual and recovery and, uh, and that's, uh, that opportunity is given to this child. Look at these three, middle school, middle school, middle school. Well, there's four, middle school, okay? Myra has talked about this in the past. We have to be very careful here because we're gonna show you something in the local needs assessment that's gonna go come back to the middle school child. Coordinate with available mentoring programs. Uh, coordinate resources, con uh, contacting each student or family to establish student needs with homework. Do they have the tools? Collaborating with programs and organizations to coordinate access to resources. Um, you know, how do we work with this child? Because this is a critical age, as you well know, as to whether or not there's going to be a decision as whether they stay in school or not. Provide presentation and information to school staff to increase uh, migrant uh, students' um, timely attention, and that they're given timely attention and appropriate interventions. That's why when Deanna goes out and visits with y'all, she will ask you about whether or not um, this child has needed intervention. And remember, we talked about that priority for, for, uh, priority for service. So if we have a middle school child in that category as well, we really need to pay attention to this particular child. So you have your middle school pieces here. You have your high school pieces here. You have general information about training, et cetera. You have students in grades three through 11, coordinate with school staff. Again, I, I'm sorry, I mentioned this again, the TMIP. Then you have your early childhood. So you have, if you have children between three and five years old, like that district that we, when we went over that unique student report, we really need to look at what kind of services does your school district have for these babies or what kind of services does the community have. And if nothing is available, then we can provide them with bright beginnings. But according to the state, this is not an option and they're very clear within the first 60 days of the school year, what are we doing with these children? Then district procedures develop and implement a set of procedures that outline a variety of strategies for partial and full credit. A lot of you have a recovery program, so you already have procedures in place of how to get children into those recovery programs. The intra and interstate goes back to the TMIP. How do we work with that? How do we work with M6? How do we get the children uh, fully supported so that they can be successful? Um, Diana Sanchez will also work with the Migrant Parent Advisory Council. We have to have at least two PAC meetings during the year. And we have had that. As a matter of fact, we've had more uh, meetings with our parents. We had our very first um, school fair, health school fair um, at Region 10. And uh, we wish we would have had more migrant parents, but you know, you have to start somewhere. And so we were uh, um, happy that we were able to support our parents in this way. And then other parents in the region were also invited. Program evaluations, make sure the PEAMS person has the information. Here's your priority for service um, information for these children. It goes a monthly, you know, you run the report, um, you develop a PFS action plan, which we do and we have sent to you. The PFS action plans must include the following. When in the school year, the Title I, it goes on to one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, we'll provide campus principals, appropriate campus staff, um, information regarding priority for service. When in the school year, the district's Title I um, migrant coordinator, MEP staff will make uh, home or community visits to uh, update parents. Um, this is very important, how the district's Title I will use NGS Priority for Service reports to give priority placement to these children, particularly at the high school level, how the district, so on and so forth, receive priority access to instructional services, social workers, whatever you have in your school district, and if these children need that, those services, we need to make sure that we provide those services to them in a priority way. A timely fashion. Then the one thing that uh, we keep stressing 
the Title I, so on and so forth, uh, plan of action in the district's improvement plan as a separate section appropriate labeled and identified. Doesn't get embedded, it's a separate section. And that plan was sent out, I think at the beginning, before, well, I know that because I sent it out, the beginning of the school, uh, prior to the beginning of the school year, um, late summer, because we know that you're working on your district plans during that time. So here, this is part of the grant. This is what we say we're doing when we sign up for this. And that is like I think I said on page 85 of your hard copy has the same information but I wanted you to have that so that you would understand why we're asking for certain active uh, certain pieces of information for documentation purposes then here part five is your plan supplemental activities is there a graduation um, a graduation plan support with your counselors? Is there a credit accrual infra, uh, information? Is there a supplemental instruction? A lot of you, a lot of you guys are using um, funding from Title I Part A to provide tutoring. So if the migrant child needs that, then the migrant child should, should receive that services like everybody else. And if they need something else, then you and I need to talk about that. Summer programs. We've had a summer program this year. We had 54 students in the summer program, and we had them from a variety of different, Dallas, Irving, Canton, um, Van Alstine. Let's see. Um, I have, let me see, I have that list here. the school districts that do this summer program and we do that because that's good uh, good academic practices but it's also you see that it is part of the grant so we have Canton, Carrollton, Dallas, Ennis, Garland, Italy, Kent, McKinney and you here you have all the different number of children that attended in their grade levels as well as the total at the bottom which is 54 students we did uh, a really good summer session we're really proud of it and the state has added STEM activities to that and so if we if we were in a setting where we would actually show you what some of the STEM activities were and the students experience and how the tutors worked with them uh, in a very very um, intentional way in a very successful way um, we're very glad for that particular opportunity for our kids they built some pretty awesome pieces this is the middle school supplemental instruction looks very much like the high school Here's the elementary, again, summer school. You see summer school at every single um, uh, grade level. Tutorials. We don't have to check every single one of them, as you see here, but sometimes the funding source is very important, and this would be the supplemental to your supplemental, which is your Title I tutorials, if that's what you, how you engage your students. And then here's your early childhood. All of these... activities come from the application and the required activities that you saw in the application is the clothing the vision the school supplies which I want to thank you when we called and we worked with you y'all were more than gracious and very timely in working with the students Um, okay, again, going back, all of this information, the application, party for service, high plan supplemental activities for high school, plan supplementary activities for middle school, elementary school, and then early childhood. And then your general support services. This is what Esther sends out and requests because sometimes you're using other funds 
to support these children. And that's what the information that we would like to have in order for us to help and support in the growth of these children. We might be doing this together. You might be doing this in addition to, or um, not really in addition to, you may be doing this as your regular program and then we're using MEP funds to support you in a variety of different ways. So this is what the application looks like. The requirements, and then it's broken out into high school, middle school, et cetera. Noting very carefully of all of the different pieces in the high school, in the middle school, forgive me. And then what kind of services are we talking about? And if we're talking about services, on page 95 of the hard copy, okay? So these are just questions that you can ask yourself uh, when we, uh, as we review the NCLB grant. And then these are some of the services that kind of you almost see it coming out of the application. Um, services may include, from our perspective and from your work, acting as a liaison for the families. Remember there was the error of visiting with the families or having them possibly come to school so that uh, the counselor or the teachers can talk to them and work with them uh, to make sure the kids are being successful or finding out what they need. Uh, in some school districts, in the ESCs, they have a migrant counselor, but they have programs that are much bigger than the ones at Region 10. We have a PAC, and that is to keep the parents informed. We have migrant early childhood programs. We have tutorials. We work our heart out to see uh, you working with your nurses after the foundational vision exams, looking for glasses, clothing, and school supplies. So there's some of the services. I'm sure that you can think of other things that you're doing with your children. Here's a local needs assessment. On your hard copy, and this is a local needs assessment for 2016-2017. So this is actually the, the, the needs assessment that we've done for this school year. And Deanna worked um, using a variety of different sources, NGS, the grades that you uh, provided us, uh, inform, uh, informational uh, inf uh, information that we've gotten from you regarding the visits that she had, the pro performance logs, and she was able to fill this out. You and you are to be commended that the one area that that we're doing very well on is um, promotion of first graders. We did not have any children that were, at least from the information you provided us, we didn't have any problems with our first graders. Um, what we had were problems with our middle school, and that was going to be our big thrust for this coming year. You see here in the notes that after all the research that Deanna did, 95%, which is 55 out of 58 middle school children, and we want to really think about having our fifth graders included in that because they're soon going to be uh, middle school kids, fail the state assessments. Sixth grade, you had 13. Seventh grade, you had 14. and eighth grade, you had 28. Those numbers really need to change, and I know that you want those numbers to change um, particularly if you have middle schoolers in your school district. And so that is something that as Diana goes out to visit, she's going to be, we're going to be talking about what is going on with these children. Remember, they may be doing relatively okay with their grades, but we're talking about failed state assessments, and we can't continue to have them fail those state assessments because ultimately they won't be able to graduate. So that's just something to look look for. Now when you get your unique student count and you say, whoa, I don't have any middle schoolers, and you go, oh my gosh, I don't have many mid you know, middle schoolers, I don't need to worry about this, but we need to worry about them in terms of the elementary because we don't want you to fall into this category. So I wanted to spend a, a little time here with the middle schooler, but if we go back to need one, the need one deals with early uh, the first graders. So we didn't have a problem with that, like I said. The second one deals with uh, who failed tax, what are the grade levels, 
uh, that how many took the test and how many did not pass the test. And we're having some issues there with those um, students. Uh, and we're also having issues with uh, lack of, of summer school attendance um, for these children. So we need to kind of look at that. You know, how many kids fail the test uh, and at the elementary level and at the high school level and how we're working with that. Then your middle school we just talked about, specific to high school students. You know, how many children are here? We've got 18 or had 18 last year at the ninth grade. That's why that information you're giving Esther is so important. Did these kids return and who returned? Because these numbers may have already changed, but you're not on time for graduation at the ninth grade level. Immediately look into who are those children, where are they going to school, and what are we doing to help support them? Because particularly if they're party for service, we have to develop a plan for them. The 10th graders seem to be doing a little bit better. The 11th graders, you know, and this trend is pretty normal for our state where the 9th graders are usually the ones that are having a little harder time in acclimating to school and then as they go up the grades they get a whole lot better. But still we need to uh, work with them. This is uh, missing courses, credit accrual, how do we work with out of state information and students that are going out of state. So your local needs assessment, if you draw a conclusion and connecting, connects very well with the application because we're using the required activities in the application to help us develop our own needs assessment here at Region 10 using those categories that are part of the application. Does that make sense? Any questions? Then, remember we were talking about your plan of action. Here is your PFS migrant plan of action. And this is the part that needs to be in your district improvement plan. This is the part where we are taking the local needs assessment from the big categories of the NCLB application and we're saying this is what we're going to do as a region in partnership with our schools in order to help and support our children. And we have neatly put, in the, put them in the categories of the, large, of the larger needs assessment of the state. So you have uh, educational continuity and this just really flows like your district improvement plan or your campus improvement plan. What are the expected goals? What are the activities that are going to be done? What's the timeline? What are the resources needed? And how are we going to evaluate? Now, if our local needs assessment next year um, has the same kind of numbers in the middle school area, then we really do need to really look at this very closely because we already know we have issues there. And our plan then needs to refocus what we're saying we're going to do with these children with and for these children. Uh, and if it's not working as any plan, we need to revise it, we need to change it, we need to get different resources, but we need to make sure that the plan is supportive of the students. So we're going from, let's see, instructional time. How much time are they actually uh, going to be in school? Page four. School engagement. What are we going to do in that area? We've taken the big pieces like school engagement and we have embedded the needs of our students within that particular category. Educational support in the home. Remember, that seemed to be a really big one, particularly for middle school kids. So what are we doing and how are we doing that in order to help our parents and help you help them? Health. Partly motivated us to have that health fair because it's saying, you know, children that are sick are not going to be doing really well in school. And then access to services. 
one of the problems with our migrant families is that they really are very, very um, reluctant sometimes to ask for services. Um, they don't even know some of the services if they're moving around from one city to the other, one state to the other. And so it becomes a challenge uh, for us of how to, how to work with them and how to help them. So that's why sometimes we'll call and we'll say, is there any other community resources in your area that can be helpful to this family meet this particular need that is either I've been identified by Domi in the local, I mean, as she has gone out to visit, I remember I shared that form that she uses to identify needs, and then we call and work with you, and in conjunction with you and your school district, we try to find resources for those, for those um, individuals. So um, your local needs assessment is truly a, a tool that we use to guide in making decisions um, to better support our kids. Then here, your last one, who is responsible? Just a, and that would be on page, it's the last page, like on page 123 of your hard copy. And so my question to you would be, know that the migrant students are eligible for free lunch without a free and reduced application. That was one of the questions in your survey. Did, were you aware that migrant students had free and reduced lunch? Who besides you needs to know that? The cafeteria people, possibly the, the, uh, the teacher, the counselor, who's ever working with those children to make sure that they're eating lunch or breakfast. Know who the migrant students are in particular priority for service students and can articulate how the students are performing. Who would be, who would do that on your campus? Is that your teacher, your counselor, both? Your principals, uh, your community liaisons? Ensure migrant students in need of support are afforded at least the same opportunities for tutorials as other children. Remember that was one of the resources and services that we can provide our children. Contact the migrant um, education office should you need any help and support with the tutorials. Who ensures migrant students have access to challenging courses? Ensure migrant students are on time for graduation. Who ensures that uh, there's appropriate cre uh, transfer credit? Who does that in your campus? Sounds like a counselor, but I don't want to interject uh, what I think. It's, it's who works with these students on your campuses. Know, know that there are no migrant st strategies to assist students in their learning. Understand that not all migrant students are ELLs. Realize that migrant students are simply students who are faced with a unique set of challenges due to migratory lifestyle. So this is just like a quick jogging of the head. Who does this on a particular campus? Okay? And before, that, that, um, that part of that notebook uh, completes the electronic notebook. But I have a few other things that I need to make sure that you are working with and that you understand. You can take that. Um, you received this on the email that Esther sent you. And here it says NGS. I'm just going to go through. This page is page one. And for those of you that have been working with us, you know that there are certain things that are needed, requested um, by us so that we can complete and honor this particular chart. Okay? We didn't put on the electro electronic notebook simply because we couldn't get to it as quickly as we wanted to. And during the year, as Diana spoke to you earlier, the, um, earlier this afternoon, uh, we're going to be adding certain things and letting you know what we're adding. But this column tells us all the required activities that we must have. That goes along, again, with the information that we are requesting and that most of, most of you have already given to us. 
it tells us the staff, the deadline, the deadline here at Region 10 for Esther, and the entry into NGS and the time requirement. So these two columns are very, are very carefully married. We need to have information on withdrawals. We need to have if a child has terminated. We need to know if a child has dropped out of school and happens to be a migrant. And this you will know, this is year round. You will see some of these. You can hardly see this here, but if you opened up what Esther sent you, they have three little stars. And every time you see those stars, that is a total requirement, ICS requirement, that we have to do. Here's what's required in October, January, March, May through August. By October, we should have all our information about limited English proficient. We should have graduation plans already in place. We should have the kids in the proper um, grade levels and courses, if they have, particularly if they happen to be high school students. We should know if they have missing credits and what are they missing and how we can help them make it up, whether it's an after school, night school, uh, recovery courses, um, substituting or making sure that they have like two math classes during a year or during a particular year if that's the only way we can do that in March this is what we are required to do you will see that the medical alert information is due we ask for this information every year in the fall we don't wait till March because this is the time that nurses are getting all their records about medical and immunizations are done so we might as well get that done in the fall and have something else to worry about in the spring So this chart is an overview of everything that is due. Now I wanted to point something out that it was new to us this year. Let's see where that is. Oh. Oh, here it is, right here. When you have an opportunity to look at this, and, you, and Esther sent out um, another uh, email earlier in, uh, during this school year, the beginning of this school year, to let you know what we needed, and what we needed was information that came, came out of this particular book. But what is new this year, um, recommended courses for the fall. We have got to have all the schedules of the students, 8 through 12. So if you kind of looked at that, but it didn't register, because sometimes for me, it does, things don't register when they should, um, this is new. And that's why for some of us, we go, oh, I'm not sure about that. We have to have those schedules so we can put those schedules on NGS. And why do you ask we need to do that? Well, a child may be moving in and out. And if a state has NGS, they can quickly see what courses they're taking. And we have, we don't waste time trying to figure out where this child needs to be placed. I believe that's why the state did that. Then everything after that. Well, here we have the MEP compliance indicators. And these are the indicators that I pointed out to you will have the three stars in the calendar. And so there's information here, the indicators are, we have to have the priority for service report. We have to have information about summer school. We have to have the PEAMS numbers on, 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 um, on the system. We have to have uh, trained staff members. We have to have student graduation plans. And it just goes on to explain what those are and what the state expects uh, with the particular indicators. Then, just like the calendar, this is what we need year-round. And Esther has very cleanly and neatly put down what we need year-round, starting with the, um, if we have students that are PFS, here's the definition of PFS, 
and what is it that we, uh, what makes them PFS, and then what kind of intervention plans uh, will help support them if they need that. Some of them may not need that. We need to have withdrawals. We need to identify students that are at risk for non-promotion. Any child that went to summer school automatically becomes an at risk for non-promotion. Even if they pass the courses, we're just afraid, I guess the state's afraid that uh, they're needing that extra support and we need to make sure they have it. We have to have the dropout indicator. We have to have, um, let's see, this is just summer school information that should help us, kind of like a worksheet for you. And then what we need now, what we need year round, what we need now is your graduation plans. Here's your STARS, special ed, IEP file indicator, and then what we need January, February. And it goes on like that, so that it takes the chart, it takes the chart, and it embellishes it, and it gives you more information about what is required during this particular time of the year. So don't be surprised when Esther sends you an email to say, I still need this, or thank you very much for providing that information for you uh, or to me, because this is her work. This is what she needs to get on the system, and this is what the state expects us to have on, on the new generation system, so that when children move, particularly within the state of Texas, and a lot of our children stay within the Texas, within the state of Texas, because we are um, an agricultural state, um, everybody in the state of Texas has access to this and be very helpful to the children. So, this NGS, Migrant for Administrators. This is both uh, sent to you via um, email, and it was also sent to you uh, electronically with the notebook. We talked about the unique student report. We talked about summer school. We talked about the application. We talked about a variety of different activities that we need to get done between now and then, and we're here to help, to provide service, to clarify, uh, question, to clarify any concerns that you have, any issues that you have, to work with your families and work with you in order to make sure that our children are doing well. We all have the same goal in mind, that is to help children graduate and graduate within a timely fashion. Uh, we have seen that the state is requiring uh, additional information re regarding a child's schedule. We see that um, they're still requiring certain things from year to year. We get very familiar sometimes with activities that we do from year to year, and sometimes we just have to take a moment like we did today, and I'm very grateful for the time that you're sharing, to simply sit back and to say, yes, I remember that. Yes, I understand that. Or maybe I need a little further clarification I need to talk to Miriam or to Diana, maybe Esther for NGS, or maybe IDNR with Domi and Anali. So, again, we're very grateful for the time that you have given us. And um, if you have any questions, please give us a call. We have at the front of the manual, both electronically and hard copy, we have everybody's name, everybody's email, and everybody's phone number, just in case. Um, you might need, uh, might need that information. Again, thank you for your time. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to get together and to be able to uh, talk MEP and to uh, assure all of us that we're on the same page. Have a great afternoon. Should you have any questions, please email them to me if you think about them tomorrow or another day. If you have any questions, I'm here. I'll be ha very happy to um, answer them for you. And um, like I said, we're here for service and to make sure that everything goes smoothly. Any questions? Lisa? <laughs> I don't have any questions, but thank you very much.
Thank you so much. I, it's really nice to know that that uh, that you you guys, all of you, were out there. I appreciate it. You have a great afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Bye bye.